Hey, good morning, everybody. So good to be with you today. Hey, if I haven't met you, my name's Taylor. I'm the lead pastor here. Stoked that you're with us this morning. And I want to start with a question. And the question is this. If I were to ask you what the greatest movie of all time is, you would say, go ahead, shout me down. Dude, Lord of the Rings is dominated today. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Who else? Give me something else other than Lord of the Rings, all right? Star Wars. I'm here in Star Wars. What else? Dumb and Dumber. Amen. Come on, everybody. Round of applause for Jared Mira over here. That's the right answer, bro. No, that, it, what's fascinating about this, guys, I was thinking about this, is there is something within us that just so resonates specifically with these stories of fantasy fiction, their categories. In fact, when you look at the top uh, movies that have uh, brought in the most revenue across the board, most of them, I think about nine out of 10, except for the exception of like the Titanic and, you know, like, I'll never let go, Jack, is fantasy fiction. It's fascinating, and uh, there's, in fact, if you look at the 2020s so far, I think this is one of the most miserable part of the 2020s, is unfortunately, this is where good film goes to die. I don't know if you realize or that or not, but all of these movies that we just talked about, most of them came out of the 90s and the 2000s, guys. We've got Star Wars, we've got Lord of the Rings, we've got the flipping Lion King in 1994, we've got Shawshank Redemption, we've got Fight Club, where's my Fight Club crew? All right. One rule about Fight Club is you never talk about Fight Club, right? All of these incredible films and works of, you know, movie art came out of the 90s and the 2000s. And now in 2020, it's like you've got Mission Impossible 20 with Tom Cruise, whose Botox bill rivals that of the Kardashian family. You know what I mean? And so, but this is, it poses this really interesting question of why do we resonate so deeply with these stories? And J.R.R. Tolkien, he is actually the writer of uh, The Lord of the Rings, and he wrote this famous essay that's really fascinating called On Fairy Stories, where he basically talks about these five different dynamics in these stories that we tend to resonate so deeply with that sort of brings us into e these moments of eternity when you are engaging with these uh, stories. He talks about how, uh, number one, and they, they depict characters who get outside of time altogether. Number two, they escape death. Number three, they hold communion with non-human beings. Number four, they find a perfect love from which they never part. And number five, good triumphs finally over evil in the end. And when he was asked the question, why? So those are the narratives, those are the themes, those are what seem to resonate. He was asked the question, why though? And as a believer in Jesus, his answer was essentially this, that for, the, for every single human being, the reason why these narratives, these things, themes resonate so deeply with us is because they're tapping into underlying and, and, and eternal realities that you and I are aching and longing for. So uh, Tim Keller, he says it this way. He says, if Jesus Christ was really raised from the dead, this is so good. If he was really raised from the dead, again, Paul the Apostle is like, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, y'all called Christians are the most of all people to be pitied. Like your faith is in vain. Christianity isn't a thing. This whole thing is a joke. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that's what's at stake. And so he said, if Jesus was really raised from the dead, then if he is really the son of God and you believe in him, all those things that you long for most desperately are real and will come true. We will escape time and death. We will know love without parting, a perfect love, the love of the Father. We will even communicate with non-human beings. This is where the scripture is going to paint this vision of the unseen realm, angels and living creatures, the divine counsel, non-human beings that we're going to share eternity with uh, in God's presence. And we will see evil defeated forever. And fairy stories especially the best and well, most well-told ones, we get a temporary reprieve from a life in which our deepest desires are all violently rebuffed. However, if the gospel is true, and it is, all those longings will be fulfilled. So what Keller's saying, what J.R.R. Tolkien is saying, the reason why we resonate with this is because these parts of these stories, it's, it's, it's a sort of whisper in the night that's beckoning us homeward. And it's pointing us to the true story, which is really the greatest story of all time, guys, which is the gospel. So everybody that said anything else other than the gospel, you're wrong. F, you know, get it better next time. But I want to talk to you today really about that, exactly that. Why is the gospel the greatest story that's ever been told? And if you look at our vision statement here, we're taking October to chat through this. This is our uh, revamped vision statement. This is where we're building everything towards the next three to five this years. It says this, our vision is a thriving spiritual family with all-consuming passion for the gospel 
gospel of Jesus. So if we're going to be a people with all-consuming passion for the gospel, one writer has said everything in the scriptures is either preparation for, presentation of, or participation in the gospel. The gospel is literally the heart of the Bible. And that's why we're saying we got to be a people with all-consuming passion for the gospel. And so if we're going to do that, we got to ask and answer the question, okay, but what is it? Right? What actually is the gospel? And so part of the problem is if we were to ask everybody in this room, even people that have been believers for a long time, what is the gospel? We would sort of stumble forward with some themes and some different ideas that wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but definitely not consistent and definitely not profoundly uh, impactful, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, in the lives of people who are just regurgitating information. We want to be a people with all-consuming passion for the gospel, guys. That's what we're going to talk about. What is the gospel? Why is it the greatest story that's ever been told? Uh, Paul, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, he makes this incredible declaration at the beginning of the book in verses 16 and 17. I'm going to read this for us as we navigate forward in our time together today. Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So right here, he's talking about the gospel, right? So let's take that word for just a second, gospel, because... Part of the problem is when you and I hear that word, we tend to think primarily and only in religious terms. Whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, you're asking spiritual questions, you're a non-Christian, non-believer, maybe you're part of a different religion, you're a skeptic, you're an atheist, you're agnostic, you don't know what you believe about God. I am so stoked that you're here. Thanks for the honor of your time this morning. When you hear that word gospel, even if you're not a Christian, you and I tend to think in primarily religious terms. It's like gospel, Christianity, Jesus, cross, right? We tend to line all of those themes and those words up, but here's what you and I got to understand. Originally, it was primarily a completely secular term. So what happened is in first century, Jesus lives, he dies, he rises, he ascends. And the church, uh, his disciples were asking this question, man, this is the greatest story that's ever been told that's going to revolutionize the planet. How do we actually define this thing? How do we bring it to a word? What do we call it? And they actually appropriated the term gospel, euangelion in the Greek, which was uh, used to declare like the inauguration of a king. It was used to declare a, a victory in war. So what happened, Rome would go out, beat an enemy. They would send evangelists, which is actually not a religious term originally, deeply secular evangelists into the city. And they would declare, hey, this is what Rome has done. You are now free. Your status has changed forever. Rome has come to your aid. This is what a gospel is. And so they see this this word. And they're like, that's it. That's what it is. That's what Jesus has done. It's a gospel. The word literally means this news that causes great joy. I love that. Isn't that so good? Like this is, if we were to categorize, define the work of Jesus, how did the church do it? They said, it's, it's like this. It's news that causes great joy. So my question for you is right out the gate is, has the gospel been that for you? Or is this just sort of like words on a page and a set of doctrines and beliefs? Has it actually become something for you that has seeped all the way down into your emotional state of being that you've responded to with just extravagant? Have you ever experienced where somebody just like bolts into a room and they're just like bursting with joy and they're just stoked about what just happened? And they come with like this declaration of joy good news. You're like, usually in our culture, it happens around sports and dating. Although unfortunately in Washington state, it's never about sports. You know, it's like, so we'll use the dating. She finally said yes. After like a year of badgering, she said yes to a date. Okay. I don't know whether to be happy for you or sad for you. You know, like that's, that's what we tend to do. That's good news. That's really good news. Yeah. You don't have to be single for the rest of your life. That's awesome. Right? Like you, you burst into the room with this exuberant joy that is a gospel, guys. And so this is, this is what we're looking at. It's the news of Jesus that causes great joy. This is really critical and really important. So I've got three points on what the gospel is for you today. Just as we begin to kind of build a theology around the gospel and build a church around all-consuming passion for the gospel. What is the gospel? Number one, the gospel is good news, which means that it is not primarily good advice. So it's first and foremost news. Stick with me here. Uh, have you ever been around the good advice guy? You guys know what I mean by the good advice guy? I see some head nods. This is the dude who always has the right thing to say, and it's super annoying, right? 
And they just, it's just like you're going through something difficult in life and they, they just don't sit with you in it. And they're just like, well, here's what you need to do. And here's what you need to do to be awesome like me. Take my advice. And you're just like, you're a jerk. Shut up and get out of my life. Nobody likes that guy, right? That's the point. This is the good advice guy. Doesn't really care about what's going on. Just has stuff that he wants to say to prove how smart he is and how he's better than you. How this works out in Christian circles, this is my favorite. Uh, I just thought about this just now. I call it prayer preaching. You ever been in a group of Christians where they're praying and they're praying for you and they're just like, oh God, I just pray that they would, you know, like uh, do all of these things that I do because I'm awesome. Pray five hours a day like I do because I'm awesome and this is what they need. That's literally you're the good advice guy, okay? So shut up and don't do that. That's a problem, okay? So here's, this is what the gospel is, guys. It's not primarily good advice. It's not stuff that you do to get better. It's not how you become a better person in the world primarily. And firstly, it is about good news. It's something that has been accomplished in history outside of anything that you've contributed to that affects affects you for the rest of your future. It's really good news that Jesus has done all of the heavy lifting. Advice is what you have to do. News is something that has been done independent of you that changes you. And this is something then that has to be announced. If the gospel is good news, that means that it needs to be preached. It needs to be proclaimed. And so what happens is, uh, you know, we get this, these weird ideas. This was totally me, so I'm just going to pick on myself and maybe you if you're here, where it, it's like we have this idea of like, look, okay, I'm a Christian now. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to all the parties because Jesus was at the parties and I'm going to love all my friends that don't know and love Jesus, which is a really good thing to do. But he was at the party, so that's where I'm going to be. And inevitably, what we end up doing is saying dumb stuff, like I'm just going to make them cookies, and I'm going to DD for them. And if I do that enough, all of a sudden, they're going to wake up to the fact that, hey, my cookies are so good. I am so bad. I need the second person of the Godhead to incarnate himself in Jesus Christ, come down, live the perfect life that I couldn't, die the death that I deserved, on and on and on. Guys, what I'm trying to say, you don't come to that intuitively. You're not gonna be able to bake enough cookies to save your friends. You actually need to preach something. Something needs to come out of your mouth. It's gotta be proclaimed. In fact, if you look at the Advent story, uh, the angels, they show up to uh, the shepherds in the field. They're announcing the birth of Jesus, what did they do? They preached. They didn't mime it. Guys, we don't, you know, in Luke chapter two, it's not like the angels showed up, all the shepherds need to change their pants and they're trying to like, you know, like communicate what's going on. You know, like, eh, like they didn't do that. <laughs> they preached. Unto you is born this day a savior in the city of David, who is Christ. The Lord, that you actually need to proclaim something. News is preached. And this is where the old uh, saying is just horrible theology. Maybe you've heard this before. I preach all of the time and sometimes I use words. Can I just tell you this, guys? That is trash theology. I understand what we're saying. I'm trying to say, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to not be a hypocrite. I'm trying to be a good person to do some good in the world. And right, that's good. That's a good thing. But you don't have to be a Christian to do good things in the world. And you're not helping people understand the gospel primarily and only through that. The gospel is good news, which means that it needs to be articulated through voice, through words in the context of relationships. This will not surface in a human system. This is God speaking. Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I love the gospel. I preach the gospel. I cherish the gospel. I elevate the gospel. This is what he's, he's gonna go on to say. I, I can't wait to come to you, Romans, so that I could preach the gospel to you. This characterized, this was the center of the dude's life. And he's saying it's all about God speaking and God interrupting and God declaring something that he is doing. Guys, this is where this becomes really good news that because it means this, that Christianity is something to be received and not achieved. Advice says that you need to do this and this and this to achieve this. Christianity, the gospel says, no, 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 something has been done for you so that you can receive a gift. Totally and completely different. It doesn't work like, okay, I'm sorry about this, but dude, I, I told you guys last week, I am so festive this year. I don't know what's happening. I'm literally trying to talk to my wife about like letting me put up a Christmas tree like right now. Anybody with me, by the way, where, where are the, uh, let's go. 
Okay, cool. I'm not alone. That was an impressive amount of hands. Okay, well, we, just lo- we just love Jesus. All right, just love Jesus. Love the birth of Jesus. Love Christmas. This time of year sucks, so I'm trying to get to the joy, all right? And the presents, and, you know, the, I might even, I'm, listen, I've never done eggnog. I've never been an eggnog fan. I might do some eggnog this year. I am so, literally, guys, I don't know what's going on. It's ridiculous. So my brain is just thinking in Christmas illustrations, so you're just going to have to deal with me. So if you look at, like, how we talk to our kids about Christmas, what do we do? Think about how how damaging this is, okay? What do we tell our kids? There is an invisible, overweight old guy that is watching you day and night. Okay, so number one, we usually arrest that guy and put him in prison, but, you know, for some reason we get a pass. Number two, what, what does he do? What's this, what's this uh, you know, older, old guy, overweight dude watching you day and night? He's keeping a list, He's, li- he's literally, what is he doing? He's writing down the good things that you're doing and he's writing down the bad things that you're doing. And every year at Christmas, kids, what happens is Santa Claus, he takes the list of the good things that you've done and the bad thing that you've done and whichever one is bigger dictates what you get and how your Christmas goes. So if you're naughty list, if you're on the naughty list, your bad works have outweighed your good works and you get coal. You get coal. But if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you get, you know, freaking whatever you want, <laughs> apparently. Because that's a, that, what am I trying to say? Guys, look at how religious that system is. That is completely antithetical to the gospel. The gospel is news, it's about what God has done, not what you have to do. The gospel is going to come around and say, no, 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 look, that's not how this works. In fact, if it was up to you and I, you are very, very, very naughty. Okay? You've been very naughty. You and I are stuck on the naughty list. For all of eternity, we have this thing called sin that's actually estranged us from God, kicked us outside of the family of God. We're in rebellion against God, uh, and, and, and we're toast, dude, unless God comes in and does something. The gospel is not good advice that says your good works have to outweigh your bad works, and therefore you can be saved and get Jesus. And listen, that's not the God. Here's, here's a part of the problem, guys. What we've tended to do, and this is, maybe you come from a little bit more of a conservative or legalist background in the church. What can be communicated, if we're not careful, is we ascend to the level of the gospel, Christian morality. So we say, here's what it means to be a Christian. You have to do this and vote this way and live this way in the world and be a good person and get your life straightened out. And inevitably what we do is we take moralism and we put it at the level of gospel. What I'm trying to say is not that you don't become a different person when you follow Jesus. I'm just saying that happens downstream. Right? right? Like this is is the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. Protestantism is saying, no, there's a difference between sanctification and salvation. That your sanctification, the process of becoming like Jesus, that's not what actually saves you. That's downstream of the gospel up here, which is all about what Jesus has done for you. Right? And then when that hits your soul, that's where you get changed and transformed and you become a different type of person. Right? And so this is where the gospel is good news. The pressure's off, dude. Like, it's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done for you. The good news of the gospel is that you and I are so broken, sinful, and flawed, way more than we ever dared imagine, Tim Keller says. But at the same time, more accepted, loved, and treasured by God in Christ than you ever dared hope, right? This is the good news of Jesus. It's not about what you do for God. It's about what God has done for you. The spirit of religion is about what you have to do to get God. The gospel is about what God has done to get to you. Religion is about, here's what you do to climb the mountain, to ascend the hill of the Lord, right? The gospel is God coming down off of the mountain to throw you over his shoulders while you're in the pig pen down below, put a new robe on you, throw a ring on your finger, shoes on your feet, and bring you up and make you a priest in his house, dude. That's why it's good news. You didn't do anything. All you did was contribute all of the stuff that put Jesus on the cross to the table, right? That's all, that's all you and I did. This is about the goodness and the greatness and the provision of God in the midst of our sinfulness and our rebellion. So number one, the gospel is news. It's not advice, which means number two, what's the news about? It's about what God, not we, have done. J.I. Packer, uh, probably like one of the most brilliant theologians of throughout church history. I think we could put him probably in that category. 
he, he says this, and maybe you're here and you're just like, okay, I want to figure out how to actually articulate the gospel. I recognize, like, it's got to be preached. I got family, friends, loved ones, coworkers that need Jesus, and I want to share Jesus. Guys, it's so complicated. We make this, or so simple. We make this way too complicated. This is part of the, one of the reasons why we actually intentionally don't have a bunch of evangelism classes here at New Song, because we tend to just overcomplicate this stuff. And he gives a really helpful way to actually think through how do you articulate articulate the gospel in a way that's concise and to the point. So he gives three words. This is the gospel. God saves sinners. That's the gospel right there. Boom. God saves sinners. He breaks it down into those three categories. And he says this, this, this literally is worth the price of admission today, everybody. And I know you didn't pay anything, so take it for what it's worth. But this is incredible. He says, God saves sinners. God, we got to start with God. Part of the problem of our secular culture is we are given to the psychological and the therapeutic. We start with us. We start with me. Therefore, we all end up being a bunch of victims that walk around that are hurt and need therapy for the rest of our lives. And part of the reason why, and all of the brokenness in the world gets perpetuated, right? Because we're saying, I am not a part of the problem. I am the solution. It's the institution that's the problem. It's out there that is the problem. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn is going to come around and say this. No, 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 look. Here's the problem with human beings, that the threat of evil goes through every single one of our hearts. And so what you and I have to do is we got to disengage from the therapeutic. we got to disengage from the psychological. Not, you know, I'm not saying that it's bad. And just please, for the love of God, keep going to therapy. Just we got to start with God. That's what J.R. Packer is saying. God, the triune Jehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons working together in sovereign wisdom, power, and love to achieve. Who's doing the achieving? God. The salvation of a chosen people. The Father electing, the Son fulfilling the Father's will by redeeming, the Spirit executing the purpose of Father and Son by renewing, saves, does everything. What does he do? Everything. He does everything from first to last that is involved in bringing man from death to sin to life in glory. Plans, achieves, and communicates redemption, calls and keeps, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies. God saves sinners. This is where the gospel gets very offensive. Men as God finds them, guilty, vile, hopeless, powerless, unable to lift a finger to do God's will or better their spiritual lot. Now, okay, so who's doing all of the doing? J.R. Packer saying, it's all God. God is the one that's doing all of the heavy lifting. Now, you and I, what we need to realize to understand the gospel, to receive the gospel is good news. We've got to understand the bad news first. If there's going to be good news, we've got to understand the bad news. The bad news is that you and I, God looks down at humanity and he says, you have chosen your own way. You have rebelled against me. You actually now therefore cannot live in a manner that's pleasing to me because you've rejected my good sovereign authority uh, over your life. In our culture, this comes with words like subjective morality. It comes with words like tolerance. Uh, and what Jesus is going to do is, how many know he does not tolerate sin, right? He tolerates and loves sinners so that they would come to repentance, but he doesn't say, continue to do whatever you want, live and sleep with whoever you want, and I'm cool with it, that's chill, everybody gets heaven in the end. That's not the gospel. we got to understand the bad news. We've rebelled against our creator. We've said, I am rejecting your good sovereign authority. I don't care about the Bible, don't care about what you have to say. I'm just going to go and make up my own hodgepodge, subjective, moral, truth, syncretistic, disaster, spell pot of morality and existence distance in life. And it's led to all of the broken that we're currently uh, experiencing today. That is sin. In the words of J.C. Ryle, actually, look at this. Uh, jumping ahead here, I think, guys, in the back. He says this, sin consists in doing and saying and thinking or imagining anything that is not in perfect conformity with the mind and the law of God. The bad news, Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have decided to go our own way. None is righteous. No, not one. There is one that is righteous, holy, and good, and it is God, right? You and I, unholy, righteous, unrighteous, and fallen, broken human beings in need of the mercy of God to come and save us. That's why the gospel is good news. That's the bad news. We're screwed, dude. Left to ourselves, we are totally and completely helpless and hopeless. Let me illustrate this for you like this. Uh, a couple summers ago, 
I think I've told you guys this story before, but it's just perfect illustration here, so stick with me. Pretend like you never heard it and laugh like you've never heard it. So what happened, a couple summers ago, I was with uh, my son on a jet ski. We were on vacation, and uh, we just out ripping it up, and, you know, like I'm getting him back for all of the childhood trauma that my mother inflicted on me when she had me on the back of a jet ski, like throwing me everywhere in Lake Chelan. Just ridiculous, all right? Still recovering. And so I'm getting him back now, just perpetuating the generational sin in my family. And, uh, but we see this like giant group of seagulls, and Asher, I love it. He's like, Dad, let's go. Let's go run him over. And I'm like, yeah, sick. Let's go. You're my kid. So this we we're just like, you know, vroom, vroom, getting over there. We freak out all the seagulls. They're flying over all the way, and they're terrified. And he's like, yeah, get out of here. And so we see this one little group of seagulls, though, off to the side. They didn't move. They didn't do anything. And, and we're like, what, what's this? What's going on here? So we, we flip around. We go over there. And we see this one bird, guys, literally wrapped, this is crazy, wrapped in fishing line with a hook in its beak. And also somehow, did some of you say, oh, <laughs> It's a bird, all right? Wrapped it, it's stuck in its beak and its foot, and like he's just <laughs> mangled. And like, it's like these group of seagulls off to the side, just chilling, like don't even care. It's like, bro, you need better friends, man. I don't know what to say about that. That sucks for you. But he's just hanging out there. He's literally drowning. I have no idea how long this thing has been there for. And I'm um, just like, well, you know, Asher, sorry, man, life's tough. He's just got to, he's stuck. And so we, we, we room off, and uh, he looks at me, and he's like, Dad. You have to help the seagull. And I was like, how am I going to say no to that? You know, like, no, I'm not, I can't, I have to do something. So I'm like, okay, we'll figure it out. So we go, we go back to the place where we're staying, and I'm like, what, how the heck am I going to get this stupid seagull out? I'm hoping that it just drowns and dies and I can't find it, just so I can come back with a clear conscience and say, well, he must have got free. So anyways, we're looking around for stuff, and I see, I find this broom, guys, and I'm like, okay, maybe I can use that, because I'm not risking rabies and lifelong disease by grabbing this thing out of the lake. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not about it. So I grab the broom, I leave Asher at the house, we get out there to the seagull, and I'm, I'm on the end of a jet ski, like, trying to hook the seagull with a broom, and I do! And it's like, I pick him up, and I'm holding him off to the side, and this poor thing is just looking at me like, oh God, I hate my life. And this would have been the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen, just a 30-year-old man on a jet ski with a broom and a seagull hanging off the end of it. But I got him back, and so we're like looking at him, and you know, I've got pliers and like some stuff, we're trying to cut them loose and eventually we, we just cut the right spot and boom, the thing goes free. And it's like a movie where he just spreads his wings and he gets up and he flies away. And it was like, boom, dad of the year award right there. Everybody else screwed. I've got the trophy. Okay. And so, but guys, per perfect illustration of the gospel. The bird, look at the bird. He, look at it. <laughs> look at it. All right. He is drowning and about to die, and his only hope is the compassion of my son. Right? And it's, this, is, this is literally you and I, guys. This is, we are drowning. We are stuck and entangled with sin and our own depravity. And I'm going to try to redeem the story here and make it spiritual. We are stuck and entangled in our own depravity and sinfulness and brokenness. And our only hope is the compassion of God sending his son to come in and untangle us from within. You guys remember Lord of the Rings, since that everybody's favorite? There's the, uh, the part in one of the movies where Frodo gets tangled tangled up by Shelob, right? He's just like getting, then he's, he's a freaky, horrible, you know, part of the movie. And the spider comes down and like gets him right in the gut and he's like laid out and gets wrapped up and everybody's like, ah, I hate this. And, right? That's, that's, that's you and I. That's what sin has done. We've been poisoned. We've been infected. We have been affected. There is no hope. The gospel it's not that just Jesus comes like Samwise and cuts us out and gets us free. No, 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 way better than that. The gospel is God takes our place, takes the poison for us, dies, suffers our reproach so that we can have perfect fellowship with God for eternity. This is primarily about what God has done, not what you and I do for God. Now, let me just say this, guys. This is incredibly liberating, but it's also lethal. That is so lethal. It's lethal to your pride. 
It's lethal to our Western individualism. It's lethal to our culture of tolerance that says, do whatever you want, be whoever you want. You're a snowflake, affirm yourself. The gospel is going to come around and say, no, 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 look. Jesus lived and he died and he rose. And now if you are a believer, that's the pathway that you take. You live, you pick up your cross, you die, you repent, you receive the gift of faith, of repentance and and faith in Jesus. You rise to new life and you live in a new way in the world. It is lethal to our pride because the gospel is going to come around and say, only God is holy, righteous, and good. Only God. We have all sinned and fallen short of his glory. We have rebelled. And he is our only hope. Now, when it comes to, so this is what the scripture is going to say. God creates man and we fall, we rebel. Now there's fracture. We are not in right relationship with the creator. This is why there's sickness, death, decay, wars, rumors of wars, terrorism, all of that sort of stuff, because humanity is not in right relationship with our creator. Now you and I, we have two options to get back into right relationship. The language of the scriptures speaking theologically would be that of justification and of righteousness and reconciliation. How do we get right relationship with God is ultimately the question. Question. That is the most important question in life. It's not how much money you got, how you get the most toys by the time you die, so you win. No, no, no. How do you get right relationship with God? You and I have two options. Call number one, my works or works righteousness. Number two, Jesus works and gift righteousness. All right, if you're taking notes, write that down. You got two options. How do you go after right relationship with God? My works or Jesus' works? Works righteousness or gift righteousness? Now let's talk about my works because a lot of people take this path and it's a disaster. You grew up in this system, okay? And it happened very young. Let me talk to you about the my works people for a second because here's, here's how this looks. Uh, when you were potty training, this was literally your parents. Okay, here's the thing. If you go number one, you get one M&M. And if you go number two, you get two M&Ms, right? It's, what are we doing? We are analyzing behavior and we are rewarding good behavior. Not a bad thing. I think it's great. Got you out of diapers. You're not wearing diapers as an adult, hopefully. And uh, it was a good thing. It ended up being a good thing. But the problem is that continues, that narrative continues throughout life. You get in school, you get a grade point average. You did uh, this good in school, so you get this grade. You get parent-teacher reviews, always giving feedback of here's what you're doing well, here's what you're doing bad, and here's how you can do better, right? Not a totally bad thing. And then you get a job, you get into the real world, and you have these performance-based reviews where your employer's sitting down, you know, here's where you're good, here's where you're bad, and we're going to adjust your pay accordingly, right? This is the religious system guys. It's right there. What are we saying? That your value and your worth as a human being is based on what you produce in the world. Completely antithetical to the gospel. You could, if you're a believer in Jesus, let me just say this, you could live under a rock for the rest of your life and, and, and some of you are like, I would like to do that right about right now. You know, stuff is crazy. You could do that, never do anything for God and he's not going to love you any less. Because his love for you isn't predicated on what you do for him, or otherwise it's conditional. Did you hear what I just said? His love for you is not conditional. If he he changed the love that he's giving you based on your religious performance, that is a conditional love that's based on your performance. This This is why, guys, this is good news. Because God loves you because he loves you in spite of you. It's just like a kid, you know, for those of you that have kids when they're born, all they do is poop and puke and keep you up at night, and suck joy and resources, and yet you're just insane crazy about them. You love them so much. As a child of God, that is the heart of the Father for you. So this works righteousness thing is very dangerous. We see it in various religions that shows up. You got to do the right things to be made right with God. I'll give you a few examples. In Buddhism, you got to cease desire. Islam, you have to live in obedience to the Quran. Hinduism. So, and the difference here is with the Bible, right? Like, does the Bible have commands that you and I are to live by? Yes, right? And we would be very wise to follow them. The difference is you're not saved by that stuff. You're saved by the work of Jesus on your behalf. The obedience stuff comes down line. It doesn't save you. It's the effect of salvation. You doing the right stuff is not salvific, to use another theological word. It's the effect of your salvation, 
right? It's the effect of right believing. And so Islam is going to say you got to live in obedience to the Quran. Hinduism says you reincarnate to pay off your karmic debt eventually. New Age spirituality says you got to live in harmony with the rest of creation. And so you might be saying, well, I'm not religious, but I'm, I'm secular. Here, let me explain to you how secularism is just as religious as anybody else. How our culture works in the Northwest, it says this, that you've got to be a, you've got to do things. You've got to be a social justice warrior. You have to do some sort of certain political activism. You have to advocate for the latest cause, all to show that you are truly a good person that is fighting the bad systems and bad problems of the world. That's how you earn your salvation. And if you don't do it, and if you fail at any point, we have this thing called cancel culture, where we're going to pour out our wrath on you and act like God. It's very religious, guys. The secular system is incredibly religious. So that's option one. You've got my works. You can say, okay, I'm building my life, uh, my right standing before God, my hope for the future on my works. And I'm going to try really hard. And what you've done is you've surrendered to an exhausting yoke of religiosity that does not save, that does not heal, that does not deliver, that does not redeem, and perpetuates all the brokenness in your life and in the world. Option number two. This is the gospel, gift righteousness, Jesus' works. This is where Paul's in, in, he's saying in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, look at this. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Faith. He's saying this is, you need an alien righteousness. You need God to actually declare you righteous in his sight. And he can do that because Jesus lived. The, you know, we talk a lot in the church about the death of Jesus, right? and rightfully so, and we should. We take communion every single week where we come in contact with the death of Jesus. Not a lot of uh, scholarship is around the life of Jesus. Why did Jesus live? Like if it was just show up and die, you know, why didn't it happen at like you know, 13 or 20 or something? Why 33? Why live an obscure life for 33 years before he's crucified under Pontius Pilate and murdered, right? And, and, and what we miss out on is he lived the perfect life, guys. He literally lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live as God incarnate. Therefore, he is the substitute for sin. And so just as in the old covenant system, the priest would take the spotless lamb without spot and blemish and sacrifice the lamb to atone and cover over the sin of the people. Now John the Baptist in the gospel of John looks at Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you become a Christian, he takes away your sin, this is the cross, and he imputes to you his righteousness as a gift, not connected to your performance, right? And guys, let me just say this. That's where sin breaks off your life, by the way. And let, me, let me go at this for just a minute here briefly, if you will allow me and you don't have a choice. Uh, I mean, I guess you kind of do. You could leave, but you don't want to leave at this point because this is hopefully going to be really good. This is why Christians stay stuck in sin forever, this is why you can't break your porn addiction. Statistically, we're probably like 70, 80 plus percent of people in this room right now. You, you, you are consistently, you have this besetting sin of pornography that you cannot actually break free from. You want to know why? It's because you're in the my works religious category. You're, you're, you're leaning into try hard moralism and do good. In fact, Thomas Chalmers produced probably one of my favorite works throughout church history called The Expulsive Power of New Affection. And he talks about this idea that the only way to break the grip of a beautiful object on the soul, it's not through deprivation. He says it's you have to show it something of even greater beauty. Porn's a counterfeit, dude. I'm telling you, you, you experience the gospel as the power of God, that thing breaks. That was my story. Dude, I, and don't, don't be like, well, you know, I'm not my story. Listen, I had a decade-long addiction to this thing. And it does the same thing with your mind as like heroin, crack cocaine, all this sort of stuff. When I truly encountered the beauty of Jesus and the power of the gospel overnight set free and delivered. Right? I mean, like, what, what are you going to do with that? Right? It wasn't through deprivation. It wasn't through, like, religious flogging. You guys remember Monty Python where you got the priest and they're like, oh, yeah, I never saw me. You know, doing that. That's not how it works. You can't beat yourself into this thing. 
You've got to believe your way into it. You can't, you can't like beat yourself up enough to get a, uh, find a state of like righteousness that God put. No, you need the supernatural enablement of the spirit of God to come and break chains in your life. And I'm telling you today that the gospel is still the power of God. Amen. He's ready to break some chains. And you can't, you can't work, in fact, let me give you an illustration for, another illustration for church history. Martin Luther, many of you are going to be familiar with that name, and you should be, real titan figure, kicked off the Protestant Reformation, nailed the 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door. What happened was he was actually a lawyer, and uh, he was going to law school, very uh, intelligent, brilliant guy, uh, and uh, he ended up being struck by lightning, and he took it as a sign. He was like, God exists, and I'm here for a purpose, and I need to give my life to Jesus. A very good thing to do. And that's how he took it. He was like, I'm still alive. I should have died. I just got hit by lightning, and yet I'm still here. So God wants to do something. So he ended up giving himself to the ministry. He became a Catholic monk and priest. And what happened was he sat with these scriptures that he saw all over the place. It's like, Jesus is saying some crazy stuff, dude, in the Sermon on the Mount. He's like, you gotta, if you lust after a woman, you got to gouge your eye out, right? Like, that's, what the heck is this? If you steal and you got issues with your hands, you got to cut your hand off. And he's like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? And he takes that to his legal mind and he interprets these things as I am bad and I am the solution to my badness. He surrenders to an exhausting yoke of religious works and he ended up tormenting himself. He literally, guys, you can read the dude's diaries. He wrecked his physical, emotional spiritual, mental health across the board because of the torment of his soul. And what happened was he ended up uh, teaching at this university and he was actually going through the book of Romans. He was teaching those two verses that I just gave to you right there. Romans 1, 16 and 17. The righteousness of God is given as a gift through Jesus to be received by faith. The righteous walk by faith. Wait a second. He's realizing I've, I haven't, I've been walking by my own strength, by my own works. I've been trying, and it hasn't been working. And he says this, as he understood this. We call this the, uh, the doctrine of justification by faith, is what this was coined in the Protestant Reformation. He says this, when he understood this, I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Now, that's what happens when you understand the gift of God in the gospel, when you are pressures off, like look, 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 the, the, the Ephesians chapter two, verse four through five, look at this. This is what he says. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You know what that means? That means when you became a Christian, immediately your status changed. You were dead in sin when you gave your life to Christ, repented, surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. Immediately, you were born again into the kingdom of light. You went from sinner to saint, dark to light, broken to redeemed, right? Like that's, it, it, you're, you're either in or you're out, guys. There's no halfway thing here. It's either you, your status has been changed, you are in Christ or you are not. There's no halfway point here. And this is really critical because Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's gonna be really helpful here. He's got this fascinating tool to determine essentially a person's spiritual condition where he would ask them a question. Maybe this is you, you're considering Christianity. You're like, what do I think about Jesus? Maybe you're a new believer here. Uh, it, it, here's the question that he would ask you if he had the opportunity to sit down with you. Are you ready to say that you are a Christian? Really interesting question. And over the years, what he noticed is people would often say stuff like, uh, I don't feel that I'm good enough. I don't feel like I'm ready for that. My life is a wreck. Look at this, 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 this. I still got all these questions. Look at me over here. I, 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 and, and he would respond to this and he would say, this is critical. Look at this, it's gonna set somebody free right now. At once, I know that they are still thinking in terms of themselves. Their idea still is that they have to make themselves good enough to be a Christian. It sounds very modest, but it's the lie of the devil. It is a denial of the faith. You will never be good enough. Nobody has ever been good enough. The essence of the Christian faith, the gospel, is that he is good enough and that I am in him. What I'm telling you today, man, is because the gospel is good news that causes great joy because it's about what God has done in Christ on your behalf. 
so that he could give you gift righteousness. What this means for the believer is that when God looks at you, it's like he's looking at Jesus. Romans 8, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if, if, you, if you have a voice of condemnation going off in your life, my question for you is where did it come from because it wasn't from Jesus. Because if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. Now, if you're outside of Christ, if you haven't repented to the Lord, repented and surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus, recognize I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, it's not by my works, that's not going to get me anywhere. If you are outside of Christ, you are condemned, right? That's what the scriptures say. This is where it's lethal. And you have to, I would call you to repentance today because where you spend eternity is predicated on what you do with the person in the work of Jesus Christ in the gospel, right? But if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Here's how sin works. You screw up, shame, guilt, condemnation, regret, more sin, more brokenness. You want to know the only way to break that? It's the grace of God. Can I tell you, if you are in Christ, I know you got besetting stuff, besetting sin. You're falling forward just like I am. You're jacked up just like I am. You're struggling just like I am. The beauty of the communion table, every single week that you and I show up here and we're saying, oh God, I am only here by your grace. Uh, You take your righteousness from me. I've got nothing to stand on, right? You and I continue to do that and God looks at us and he doesn't see your sinfulness. He sees beloved son, beloved daughter, with whom he's well pleased because his love isn't predicated on your religious performance, but what Jesus has done for you. Okay, I could go for hours. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. Community team, go ahead and come on up. Why? Because this is, this is the greatest story that's ever been told. Number three, third thing, what is the gospel? The gospel of the story, it's the story of God's great love for you. That's what it's all about. In fact, in 1 John 4, verse 10, look at this verse here. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What's the good news of what God has done for you in Christ? This whole thing called Christianity, guys, here's where it starts. It starts at the extravagant love offering of God as he puts on flesh, dies the death that you deserve because of sin, absorbs the wrath of God on your behalf, dies, rises to new life so you can have new life in him and eternal life in the age to come. Christianity is not about, oh, you just got to love God more. Love God more, right? Like, ah, do it. Try hard. No, no, no. That's not how this works. That's never going to work. This is about you positioning yourself as a dependent and saying, oh, in, in the midst of all of my stuff, God, you love me enough to pursue me, forgive me, redeem me, die for me. You receive that great love, and that is what changes. How can you not respond with, this is good news that causes great joy? This is the gospel. This is the communion table. His body was broken. His blood was shed. Because while you were still a sinner in darkness and brokenness in life, that's when he put up his life for you. So let me pray for us. Would you stand with me? So we approach the communion table. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and do what only you could do. You would come and take these distant truths, make them real to us. Pray where there needs to be repentance, there would be repentance at the communion table. The cross is proof that sin is serious. It's not just like a, oh, look at this, you know, bad thing over here. No, it killed you. This is what you gave up your life for. So as we come to the broken body and shed blood this morning of Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, we recognize that in view of all of our brokenness, sinfulness, that's when you laid down your life for us. God, I pray that we would be met in this moment by the love of God that transcends all understanding. And I thank you that these are moments when lives are transformed in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. All right, everybody, we got three tables left.